Hello and welcome to another episode of A Brief History. Today's episode, Nintendo. Ready, set, oh, and when I say Nintendo, I mean more of Nintendo as a home console developer and not just as all of Nintendo because that goes all the way back to 1889 and ready, set, go. July 15th, 1983, after spending nearly a hundred years making cards, toys, and eventually Pong systems and arcade games, budding video game development company Nintendo decided they wanted to try their hands at world domination. Releasing an 8-bit gaming console known as the Famicom in Japan and then later releasing it in North America. America on October 18th, 1985, under the name the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, for context, the home gaming market in North America was in somewhat of a crisis in the early 1980s. Atari's quantity over quality business model had ruined all interest in their Atari 2600 system, and no one really wanted home video gaming consoles anymore. But here came the NES with its best friend Super Mario Brothers, and let's just say it didn't take long for these people to change their minds. The NES was a massive success, moving nearly 62 million consoles during its life worldwide. It was also a creative oasis for developers, and was the birthplace of many of the most popular and influential franchises in gaming history, including Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Castlevania, Final Fantasy, Mega Man, and the timeless classic, Totally Rod. <laughs> It's totally rad. However, as the 80s were coming to an end, competitors such as Sega began releasing their own, more powerful 16-bit consoles. And in order to keep their throne, Nintendo would need to upgrade their hardware. And thus, the world was given the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, a 16-bit powerhouse released in North America on August 23rd, 1991. The SNES took everything gamers loved about its predecessor and polished it all to a gleam. Graphics were better, music was better, controls were better, and everything was just bigger and better than it was before. But as the years went on, Nintendo became more and more ambitious with the system. Through the implementation of things like Mode 7 and the Super FX chip, the SNES was actually able to output crude 3D graphics, as seen in games like F-Zero and Star Fox. The next step was clear. On September 29th, 1996, Nintendo released the Nintendo 64, a console dedicated entirely to fully polygonal 3D gaming. And while the system was revolutionary in its sheer scope, it had some stiff competition and and Nintendo wasn't really making it easy on themselves. They still insisted on publishing games on cartridges rather than CD-ROMs, which were becoming the industry standard. And this decision cost them several exclusives, like Final Fantasy VII. You've probably never heard of it. But despite this, the N64 still managed to sell an ironic 32 million units, which was good, but a notable downgrade compared to the sales of their previous consoles. And unfortunately, this lack of sales would only get worse with their next console, 2001's GameCube. Hey! Nintendo finally started making disc games! This is what you wanted, right? Yeah, around the same time, Microsoft released this behemoth of a system called the Xbox, which was basically a PC made exclusively for gaming that would eventually even be able to go online for multiplayer. GameCube had a handle and some baby discs. So while the GameCube's library boasted undisputed classics like Metroid Prime and Smash Brothers Melee, the system ended up placing dead last during the sixth generation console wars. So let's just say that Nintendo had quite a bit of catching up to do. And in a gaming market that valued graphical prowess and easily accessible controls, Nintendo knew it only made sense to do none of that. Nintendo Wii, Oh yeah! Released on November 19th, 2006, the Wii was a strange beast. What with its lack of HD graphics and its focus on motion control, on paper, the Wii didn't sound like a very commercially competitive console, but actually the opposite was true. The system was notably cheaper than its competition, and games like Wii Sports and Super Mario Galaxy quickly justified the motion control setup. Both gamers and non-gamers alike could could find something to love in the Wii, resulting in the console becoming an unprecedented smash hit, moving an insane 101 million units in its lifetime. But Nintendo would not be riding this high horse for very long. Come 2012, Nintendo decided to follow up their Wii system with the similarly branded Wii U. This system chucked out the motion controls in favor of a freaking Game Gear-sized touchscreen tablet controller. And the goal of the system was... Well, no one really knew what the Wii U was for. The tablet wasn't technically portable, many developers were unsure how to program for the asymmetrical dual screen setup, and those games that were designed for it were almost always viewed as clunky. But confusing selling points aside, the Wii U was still a pretty solid console. It brought Nintendo into the world of HD and boasted some of my personal favorite games in the company's history. Unfortunately, good games don't count for much when no one buys your console, and the Wii U's lack of third-party support and confusing marketing led to pretty abysmal sales. The system only sold around 13 million units, making it Nintendo's biggest home console bomb, period. So Nintendo's reputation in the home console
console market had fallen pretty heavily. Gone were the days of sheer dominance, and by the early 2010s, Nintendo was essentially buried by its competition. But there was an upside. You see, one thing that Microsoft, Sony, and the PC gaming market could never compete with was Nintendo's complete and utter monopoly over the handheld gaming market, which dates all the way back to 1980 with the company's Game & Watch series of handhelds. These primitive little LCD systems were pretty cool toys for their time, but Nintendo didn't strike handheld gold until 1989 with their classic Game Boy. The Game Boy's ease of accessibility and ability to recreate games similar to those on the NES made it an instant classic that spawned a whole line of successors that added everything from color graphics to an advanced 32-bit processor. But around 2004, Nintendo decided that it was time to try something different with their line of handheld systems. And thus, the world was given the Nintendo DS. This system was essentially a Game Boy Advance SP, except with an added touchscreen and the ability to run fully 3D games. And similar to its beige brick ancestor, the Nintendo DS was a massive success that spawned a whole line of successors, the most notable of which was the Nintendo 3DS, which introduced the gaming world to stereoscopic glasses 3D. Well, actually, Nintendo did try to bring 3D to the gaming world back in 1995, but uh, it didn't really go anywhere. We try not to talk about it much. So Nintendo's presence in the handheld gaming market was, for the most part, completely unmatched. Sony's PSP and PS Vita systems never really caught on with US audiences, Microsoft never even tried to compete, and the mobile gaming market is really a different beast entirely. So while Nintendo's home consoles may have been struggling, they were consistently knocking it out of the park when it came to handhelds. And suddenly, it clicked. Nintendo knew exactly what to do in order to start their climb back to the top after the failure of the Wii U. Their new plan was to take the concepts of a home console and a handheld console and merge them together into one flexible gaming experience. And these efforts manifested themselves in Nintendo's newest entry in the console market, the Nintendo Switch. Released on March 3rd, 2017, the Nintendo Switch is perhaps the most accessible system Nintendo has made in ages. Now, the Switch doesn't do much of anything majorly different than, say, the PS4 or Xbox One. One, but at no point while you're playing Ratchet and Clank or Gears of War 4 can you approach your console, pick the game up, and take it with you wherever you go. This was the Nintendo Switch, a console that, with a simple snap in or out of its dock, can transform from a home console into a handheld and vice versa. But beyond just the system itself, Nintendo's games on the Switch also seem to be showing a renewed sense of creativity that Nintendo really hasn't seen in a while. The console launched with the critically acclaimed Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, a game which completely rewrote wrote the Zelda formula and has taken the gaming world by storm as a result. And down the line, it appears that Nintendo will be doing something very similar for their flagship franchise Super Mario in Super Mario Odyssey, showing that contrary to popular belief, Nintendo still has quite a few new and interesting tricks up their sleeves. Nintendo has been around since 1889 and has been making video games since the late 70s. They saved the US gaming market with the NES, helped revolutionize it with their Nintendo 64 system, and vastly broadened its mass market appeal with the Nintendo Wii. They've had their fair share of missteps over the years, but at the end of the day, Nintendo is gaming. Virtually everything we as gamers associate with our favorite pastime is something that can be linked back to Nintendo. So whether you love them or think they're overrated, it's impossible not to recognize the unbelievable impact that Nintendo has left on the video game industry. And all these decades later, Nintendo have shown that they can still grow and change, working harder than ever to provide their fans with new and engaging experiences, just as they did over 30 years ago and just as they will for many many decades to come thanks for watching guys dftba Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my Nintendo Brief History, I hope you liked it, and if you'd like to see some more Nintendo content, you can check out my last episode about Yoshi. Or if you're just in the mood for more Brief History in general, I've really been amping up production over on my personal channel, Foot of a Ferret. So if you'd like to see some of those, you can check out a playlist of recent episodes right here, and that's about it, so I'll say it again, thanks for watching guys, and DFTBA.